watching by uh, streaming video. If you want to send in questions, you can use the Twitter handle at the bottom of the screen or the email address at the bottom of the screen. I think we're a little loud in here right now. I hear, I hear myself. Thank you. Uh, so again, for those of you on streaming video, remember that you can uh, send in your questions. So I want to take a, a few moments today and tell you about implementing a value-based financial model here at the university. I, will, I'll, uh, I don't want to talk the entire time, for obviously you'll all fall asleep. And secondly, it doesn't give you the opportunity to ask questions. Really, the most important part of this is for you to have a chance to ask me questions. Uh, the second piece that I want to say is this is something that we've been working on since January. Uh, there was a committee formed back in January, the Financial System Accountability Committee, that went through a variety of um, steps in which we looked at and discussed our philosophy and values here at the university. Over 100 people were interviewed uh, at various levels of the university and said, what are the kinds of things that we think are important? And then looked at what is the type of model that best fits with those values and that philosophy. From that, we came to a value-based financial model, which I'll uh, talk about today. But I'll also spend a few moments telling you about our current financial model and how that operates and what are the differences between the two. <clears throat> I feel like I'm in church because everybody's sitting in the back. <laughs> so for those of you who brave souls sitting up front, thank you uh, for that. Okay, so with any model, I believe, you must start with your mission. And I won't read to you, but this is the University of Kentucky's mission statement. And I think we have to remember that every model should support our mission of teaching, research, and service. It has to make sure that it values all three of those things and that we put in place uh, systems and processes that value those three missions of teaching, research, and service. We're a land-grant institution, and that is critical to our, uh, our overall mission. So again, you see those values there uh, as part of our mission statement, and that really forms the basis for what we're going to be talking about. So let's spend a few moments talking about the current financial model that we have and the model that we're looking to move to. On the left is our current model, and it's called incremental budgeting. In incremental budgeting, it's a very centralized system in which it has the following characteristics and the following benefits. But the characteristics fundamentally are that units, and when I use the term unit, I mean colleges, or support units. And remember that we have uh, not only academic colleges, but we have support units like student affairs, enrollment management, international affairs, um, athletics, facilities, et cetera, et cetera. But units receive a budget that comes from a pool of money of state slash tuition dollars. State and tuition, it's all combined into one pool and they get an allocation that is equal to their direct expenses. Direct expenses being salaries and benefits, current operating expenses. We also break it down into travel, communications, and printing are the, the four fundamental categories besides salaries. You don't get other money besides that. That's the monies that you get from that allocation of state slash tuition dollars and so unit managers typically manage to those expenses. They have no control over revenues. They simply manage the expenses. So for instance, uh, let's use a college as an example. If a college were to change their enrollment by some number, up or down, they don't know that that number, that their allocation will change unless they come to the provost and strike a deal on how that would change. Likewise, your budget doesn't go up or down except typically by what the state allocation has changed. And unfortunately, lately, it's primarily been going down. And so your budget is simply whatever you got last year, plus or minus a little bit, unless you strike a special deal. Okay, so, so units really don't have much control over their revenues and don't know that if they do X, that Y will happen. I feel like I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Are you all feeling like I'm, it's okay? All right. So in incremental budgeting, there are some benefits to that system. 
One is that it provides a consistent treatment of budgets over time. You get the same amount you got last year, plus or minus a little bit. Now that's making a very big assumption, and that's that your budget was appropriate in the first place. Okay, so it's assuming that your budget was the right budget, but you can be sure that it's going to be consistent. It might be consistently right, it might be consistently wrong, but it's consistent. The second is that it is very simple to understand and facilitate, because you're going to get whatever you got last year, plus or minus a little bit, and you're only managing to those direct expenses of salaries and basically current operating expenses. It does provide the opportunity for equity across units, but again, that's assuming that your budget was the appropriate budget when it was started at some point in time historically. Okay. There are also some considerations. I won't call them uh, negatives for either of the budget models, but considerations. It does require stability of funding and consistent priorities. Because now, as, if the funding's not consistent, and you're basing it on what you got last year, somebody's short if the funding's not consistent. Certainly this year it wasn't consistent because of this change, the 6% change by the legislature. <coughs> but it also assumes that you have consistent priorities. Because remember, we're giving everybody what you got last year, plus or minus a little bit. So as long as our priorities haven't changed, it's okay. It does need periodic rebasing to ensure that the base doesn't become an entitlement or that you're not underfunded because you've grown and now didn't get adequate resources to match your growth. And finally, it does encourage spending to maintain your budget because if you didn't spend it, then there's always the risk that, well, you really didn't need it, so we'll take it back. So you spend everything that you've got so that you make sure that you get that amount la next year. Okay? <clears throat> the incentive-based, or we call it a value-based model, has a different set of benefits and a different set of considerations. It does promote entrepreneurship because now your revenues are attributed to you. That doesn't mean that the unit will be collecting its tuition individually. It means that it will be attributed to you. And so now you can begin to think about, if I do X, Y will happen. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. If you increase your number of en your enrollment by 10 students, and you're an undergraduate college, and those 10 are from Kentucky, your revenues are going to go up by $90,000. Because it's $9,000 per year tuition times 10 students. It's $90,000 per year. And you can begin to project ahead that, OK, if those 10 students stay, that's 90,000 extra this year. And I keep the same number next year. I got 180. And you can see how the numbers start walking up, and you can begin to plan a little bit longitudinally. Another example is you might say, well, gosh, there's, there's some outstanding out-of-state students who add to our diversity pool. And we've got an out-of-state tuition, and maybe I can do some things to encourage them to come to the university by giving them a, an internal scholarship that I will get $18,000, I'll give them back $3,000 as a scholarship, but I'm still $6,000 ahead, which is the difference between nine and 18 after giving that $3,000 internal scholarship. You can begin to make those kinds of decisions within your own units. <clears throat> the second is that it does encourage efficient administrative services because now you begin to know what you're paying for those administrative services. Someone asked me one time, they said, you know, in these incentive-based models, I've heard that your taxes, they call them taxes, just go up and up and up. Well, actually, if you look across at our peer groups and others that have done this, it usually stays pretty flat. But I said, what are your taxes now? And that's the response I got. You don't know what your taxes are now. You only know that you get an allocation after all those things are taken out. So you really don't know what your taxes are now that you're paying for the provost's office, or for student affairs, or for the registrar, or for, for facilities. You don't know that, you just know what you got in the end after all the taxes were taken out. You didn't get that itemized statement like you do in your uh, monthly paycheck. You just got the end result. It does align revenues with the costs. You begin to say, if I take this many students, I'm going to need this many 
faculty to do that. And I, I know that I'll bring in this much money with this additional number of students. I'm going to need this much faculty. Does it come out to be a net increase or is it a decrease? Likewise, I perform a certain service. Do I take that on? Does it, it uh, come out that I, it's a positive? So you begin to be able to monitor that. And I'll show you an example of a budget in a few moments which will explain some of this. And it does facilitate conversations about priorities. It makes you talk about then what is our out-of-state to in-state mix and what's our priority for that. It makes you talk about what is our enrollment mix and, and the number of students. Uh, where do we want to put our money? Because now it's all laid out uh, very clearly for you. There are some considerations with this one as well. Uh, the first is that it does require strong central and local unit leadership. Though I will tell you that any financial model will struggle with out strong leadership. Any model will struggle without strong leadership, but this needs strong leadership at the local and the central level because now it's a much more decentralized model. You're getting to make more decisions at the local level. Some criticize it for replacing an academic focus with a financial focus. We haven't had to think about that before because we've had a, a centralized incremental budgeting system where that's all been taken care of somewhere else. But now you begin to think about that at the local level. Uh, but I, this is the reason I started my presentation with the university's mission. It's still about our mission. Now, should we be making widgets just to make money? I don't think so because that's not part of our mission. So you've got to make sure that you match those two together. And then the question becomes, does it challenge academic collaboration? Does it pit one college against another? It can if you don't pay attention, if you don't do the right things and put the right systems in place, that's potential. I, I'm not picking on any one college, but for instance, let's say the College of Engineering decided they really didn't want to pay arts and sciences for teaching physics, and so they had physics for engineers. Is that the right thing to do? Probably not. We have a physics department that does quite well. So you begin to have those conversations, but that also becomes a purview of the Faculty Senate as well because the Faculty Senate has to approve all courses. So there are also some checks and balances in there as well. Okay. So each model, every model has its strong points and each model has its things that you need to consider. So this is a, a hypothetical situation. If you try to sit and figure out whether this is your college, you will not be able to because it is not any one of the colleges. I can vouch for that. I've seen all your budgets, I've seen all the unit budgets. This ain't your budget. In fact, it has a lot of stuff in it for example's sake. I'm going to walk you through first, I'm calling it the old model, but you can also call it the current model and how your budget looks, and then I'll walk you through how your budget would look under a values-based system. In the current model, you are attributed revenues like program and course student fees, clinical revenue, gifts and endowment and investment income, sales and services, grants and contracts, the direct cost, mandated appropriations, other income, and your state slash tuition based budget. Okay, that's, that's the way we calculate it. You don't actually see that. We give you this number, the $20 million in this case, we give that to you based on the tuition and the state base, and then you get to keep many of those things. But again, some of those are attributed to you, but you don't really see where this comes from other than we give it to you. You don't know if you generated 20 million in tuition. 30 million, 10 million, and what was your state appropriations? You do generate these things. In the value-based model, you have those same factors, but now there is no st state slash tuition-based budget because you are attributed your full tuition and fees. In this case, it's 32 and a half million. And your state appropriations are 7 million, and you're also attributed your facilities and administrative costs, that's those indirect costs off of grants. So the big change here is that your tuition and state is broken out, and you see both of those at the full amount, 
and you see your F&A costs. You say, wow, what a windfall. We now have $58 million of revenue versus $35 million of revenue. Life is good. Well, everything has accounting to it. So let's walk through the expenses side. In the current model, you have your direct expenses, and these are essentially the same categories of expenses you have now. Salaries and benefits, supplies, capital, computer services, communications, maintenance and repairs, rentals, service fees, travel, debt service, other expenses. Okay, that's, that's typical. You all see those in your budget already. What you don't see in your budget now are those other charges like academic overhead. This would be things like the provost office, the president's office, scholarships, enrollment management, the bursar, registrar, all of those kinds of functions, administrative overhead, president's office, university budget office, those types of things, because that's all being taken out before. Now we're actually showing you what it is. Campus affairs, research, facilities, and a strategic investment fund. Let me take a few moments and walk through those. So again, I, I went through academic overhead, which includes financial aid, plus those uh, units related to academics. Administrative overhead, I gave you a couple examples of that. Campus affairs, that's things like the Office of Faculty Advancement, uh, many of those types of support uh, units. Research now, remember, you're getting all of your facilities and administrative costs. But there is a cost to run SPA, there's a cost to run OSPA, there's a cost for the Vice President for Resources <coughs> Office, there's a cost for the IRB, a cost for the IACUC, the Animal Care Committee. All of those have to be covered. But you see how that gets assessed to you. Likewise, facilities. Right now, none of us pay facilities costs unless we have some off-campus facilities that we're paying for because of a grant or something like that. Right now, we don't have that, but in this new model, you are charged facilities. Now, I'll make a few commentary points here. One, what, I'm going to use a double negative, what is the disincentive now to taking as much space as you can? There isn't any. You grab as much as you can and you hold on to it for as long as you can. It's great if you're a unit and you have a hold of it, but it also doesn't put that in the mix. And Wayne stepped out for a second. I, I, he'd be smiling right now. Uh, Wayne Ritchie, who runs Provo Space, but think of it the other way, taking the space that you need, and then it frees up space for other programs. So right now, we, we actually have some perverse incentives already in our current model, and that is to, we have an incentive to be less than efficient with space, because there's no cost to it. So it, it, again, it begins to attribute that to what you uh, actually use. This is the number that also I need to spend some time talking about strategic investment fund. Most of what we've talked about up to this point is pretty formulaic. It's pretty formulaic, and let me explain what I mean by that. For instance, your tuition and fees. As you begin to walk through tuition and fees, you have to think about how you generate those. And um, let's take the example of arts and sciences who does a significant portion of our teaching of undergraduates, particularly in the freshman year. But not all of those people are arts and sciences majors, right? They're engineers, and they're pre-nursing, and they're pre-dentistry, and they're communications, and they're education, and they're that. So the question is, do you attribute that tuition to the College of Record, where they're enrolled, or do you attribute that tuition to the College of Instruction, who's actually delivering the teaching? Or do you do a mixture of the two? Do you have 75% of the tuition go to the College of Instruction, who's bearing the cost of paying that professor and all of the carrying out of that course, but there's still a cost to having that student in your college, and so 25% goes to your college. I'm making up numbers. But you can begin to see how you can then allocate tuition but it's generally allocated according to some kind of a formula. So now, most of the things up here are either direct to you or by, by virtue of a formula that is allocated to you based on some effort that you perform. 
But there always has to be, I believe, and we've been hearing from everybody pretty much we've talked to, there has to be a strategic investment fund for two purposes. One is what we'll call, uh, I'll, I'll use a, a fairly straightforward term, truing up budgets. Not every college or every unit will generate revenues equal to or greater than their cost. We just need to understand that and accept that. That's part of being a university, is that we have a breadth of things, and some of them generate more revenue than do others. Give you a couple examples. Um, let's take the College of Fine Arts and the School of Music and teaching cello majors. That's a pretty expensive proposition because you don't say, well, I'll just put 60 cello majors in a room and we'll have one faculty member teach cello. It doesn't work that way. That's not a very effective method of teaching cello. But yet if it's a, um, a biology course, we may be able to have a lecture room with 60 or 100 or even 200 students and then laboratory sections. But that also has a different cost of instruction associated with it. So we need to make sure that we are a university of the whole and not a university where everybody has to carry their own weight financially. That doesn't mean they can't be efficient, but we need to make sure that money is there. So some of this goes to true up those units who don't generate revenue equal to the cost. And we know that, and that's okay. Likewise, if you take uh, some of our, our service units, they, don't, they can't make money. How do you make money on the counseling center? You don't charge students and say, well, we know you need counseling because you're having problems and we need $20 for you to have a visit in the counseling center. That's probably not gonna work very well. We need to provide that as a fundamental support service and so you need money to do that. Likewise, you need money to make strategic investments to say here is a new area or here's something that we need to invest in. We need some dry powder, I call it, to do that. And so you need to make sure that you have that strategic investment fund there. It can't all be formulaically driven. There needs to be some that you can either true units up or make strategic decisions. But you get charged that. Everybody contributes a portion to it and some may get all of it back. Some may even get more than they put into the strategic investment fund back because they need truing up. Other units may not get all of it. But remember, we've got to think of the good of the whole and not just an individual unit in isolation. So when you come through now, though it looked like we got this huge windfall in revenues, we also have a different allocation of costs or expenses. So the net here is actually $50,000 margin in both cases because now we've allocated the expenses out fully to those units. But the net result is the same. But also now you, you can keep that $50,000. Now you have an incentive to run your unit more efficiently because you get to keep the difference. Now if you get up to gazillions and gazillions of dollars, we're probably gonna say you got plenty of gazillions of dollars, and so we're gonna share that a little bit more. That gets back to the strong leadership. But I don't see any units making gazillions and gazillions of dollars, so we're not there yet. But if you get there, I'd love to see you and love to talk to you, okay? But that's not it. The idea is that you now have a way of beginning to manage your costs, and you can also begin to manage your revenues. So you can have a lot more local control instead of depending on somebody else to make all the decisions for you and hoping, or that you are good at beating up the provost and getting a good deal. And, and we have decades and decades of deals. I can assure you I've seen a good number of them now. They pop up periodically and I find this deal that's different for one college versus another college. That's not a real great system, and I can tell you I don't feel comfortable with that system. I don't feel comfortable being the person who makes all those decisions, and I can tell you that I know that you know how to run your units better than I do. So, 
So how do colleges receive funding in this new model? Well, on the front end, you get those revenues based on those formulas. Either it's a sales and service contract or a grant, you get those directly. Or you get your tuition based on some formula. Maybe you get it all allocated to you. Or maybe you get, again, 75% based on the student credit hours you teach and 25% based on the uh, college where the student is enrolled. On the back end, we have an opportunity for that centrally held strategic investment fund that I talked about, where we have now uses like rebalancing, or it's also called subvention. I'm not really crazy about that term because it sounds way too much like subversion. So I kind of like the truing up as a much better term. Uh, you can use it to reward quality and success. Let's say a unit really performs outstandingly well. You can begin to use that strategic investment fund to reward that incredible success. Let's say a unit had a 70% retention rate and they moved that to 92%. You can begin to reward them for that. And you're going to have more money to do that because you're going to have higher retention, which means higher revenues as well. Uh, you can use it for startup funds. You know, one of the things that we have right now is in the Vice President for Research Office there, most of the F&As are kept at the VPR level. And then you go and ask for help with startup funds. If we allocate the F&As out to the units, then you're going to be responsible for your F&A or your startup funds a lot more. We're looking at actually a hybrid model that allocates more out to the units, so you've got incentive to bring in more F&As, but there's also the potential to have some centrally held funds to invest in key areas. For instance, let's say we make, uh, we decide that there are five key areas of focus for research at the university. Then you can access those funds if you're hiring in those key areas. So it gives you a way to strategically invest in certain uh, areas. And then lastly, we're considering a mi microfinancing pool. Anybody heard of microfinancing? It, it's a process where you uh, put out, for instance, $25,000, you can essentially borrow it, or $50,000, you can borrow it, and you say, and I'll repay it in three years because I believe in my business plan to do this. And so we kickstart you to carry a, a new project forward or a new initiative. And so use it as a microfinancing pool, again, a way that you can start new things and have access to a pool of money to do that. So the, the fundamental differences between the two models are that in one, all of the overhead is essentially taken out before you get your allocation and you manage to expenses because you don't have revenues directly attributed to you. In the values-based model now, you have all your revenues attributed to you, but you're also attributed to the expenses that are associated with the operation of your unit. And so it's a, it's a different philosophy, but now unit directors, be it deans, whatever you might be for your unit, can now begin to make decisions and begin to say, if I do X, Y will happen. And you can begin to plan two and three years ahead. If my enrollment changes, I know my revenues will change by this much, or if my grant dollars change, I know this will change and my F&As will change, and so I can begin to plan what might be the startup packages and how much money will I have for startups. You can begin to think through that instead of having to come back and say, okay, provost, I need some money, or I've changed things, will you cut me a deal? And again, I can tell you that the deals are different based on units. And, and that's what I found, and so I'm trying to get that. I don't like having different deals for different units. I like having something consistent so everybody knows what the rules are, and everybody knows how to play within those rules. Okay. So one of the questions, I've got an appendix here, and I'm going to go ahead and go to it, is the question I get quite frequently is, well, who else has done this? Are we the first university in the United States to do this? And of course, the answer is no. Uh, but here are some, oh, one more. one more, there's the, that, we'll get back to the last part. This is the universities that, it's a small listing of universities that have done this, and you'll notice that they are a variety of different types of universities, and I want to make that point. So Penn is obviously uh, not a land grant like us, neither is USC or Vanderbilt, but you have Purdue, which is a land grant just a few hundred miles north of us that's been in this model since 1995. Uh, Ohio State is another land grant. 
Uh, I believe Clemson is a land grant, Auburn's a land, land grant, Illinois, Iowa, um, Minnesota's in here somewhere. And, and so there's a variety of land grants in here as well that have gone through that. This has been very informative to us because of uh, uh, several reasons. One, they have that tripartite mission of teaching, research, and service, and they have mandated programs like the Extension Service, which is part of a land-grant institution. So there are, in fact, other uh, universities that have gone through this. Some have done it for 15, 20 years and have experience with it. Every one of them has to go through about every three to five years and look at where they're at and say, okay, how's it working? How's it going? Do we need to make adjustments? And you make adjustments. Uh, so it's not, no model is ever final. No model has the perfect answers. And I would say our current model doesn't have the perfect answers either because we make adjustments to it every year. But this one gives you a chance to begin to plan. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to stop for a minute and, and give an opportunity for questions. And then if we get some time, I'll come back to this uh, uh, values-based performance funding and some questions that might arise about that and how you begin to look at the success of units and the uh, uh, way that they're operating and how efficiently and effectively. So again, I promised you I didn't want to have too many slides, keep it relatively brief, and most of it will be a dialogue and an exchange of questions, and I'll do my best to answer. I also have a, a, a two helpers with me, uh, Melody Flowers, the director of the financial model implementation sitting in the front, who will bail me out if I need, and Lisa Wilson, uh, the associate provost for finance and operations out of the provost budget office, who also will uh, save me if I need saved. So with that, I'll uh, take a few moments and uh, see if we can get some questions going. Yes, sir. <coughs> Very good question. Let me, let me address this in steps, if I can, because there's several facets to your question. Uh, taken even further than professional schools, we have uh, differential tuition. So we have uh, undergraduate colleges have a tuition of 9,000 year in-state, 18,000 year out-of-state, and then we have differential tuition in colleges like law, uh, pharmacy, medicine, dentistry, and uh, have differential tuition. So what we're working through is how do we assign that, those cases of differential tuition. And so I'll, can I put the professional in that differential tuition category? And so do, we, uh, do they also go under the formula of some percentage to the College of Record and College of Instruction? Well, in fact, most of their teaching is in that college. In, in that case, it's probably not gonna matter ma much which way you go because they're doing 90 to 100% of their teaching. And so it, the percentages are going to end up being they get essentially that amount. The one that's a little bit more, um, it's going to take a little bit more thought and we're beginning to walk through is the graduate tuition question. Because um, there's graduate tuition paid for by grants and contracts. There's graduate tuition paid for from some college general funds money. There's graduate tuition that comes from the graduate school. There are tuition waivers. It, it's a more complicated animal to walk through. And so uh, w I will tell you that we don't have all the answers for that, but we're, we're beginning to walk through what are the things that go on with graduate tuition and how we begin to look at that again so there are the proper incentives and there aren't disincentives in there and how does it work here at Kentucky. I will tell you that our model will be different than every other one of those that I showed you because we need a, a model that works for us. And so the graduate tuition piece is a harder one that I'm trying to get my head and arms around and trying to help the committee get their head and arms around because we've had exactly that discussion you're talking about is how do we handle that. I, I don't have a, a definitive answer for you.
Uh, yes, but I, and I'll tell you, I lived through a system at Minnesota where it was $28 per square foot. And they charged everything the same. And they said it's for the common good. And I, I think you can spend time, I'm going to editorialize for a moment. I think you can spend too much time and too much money trying to track too much. And so uh, I would, if, if I were making the decision, again, it's a committee and we're recommending to the president, but I would advocate that we have one square footage cost because even within a college, you, you, you have lab space, you have office space, you have common space, you have, you end up spending all your time trying to keep track of it and then who moved into what lab and out of what lab and it just gets crazy after a while. I would advocate for one cost and say, hey, we're about the University of Kentucky and it's for the common good. And so let's just spread that over, over everybody. Likewise, I wouldn't advocate, advocate charging by specific building or specific office for heat and light. How would you ever track that? I, I, I don't know how you... Simplify it. Simplify it. So we're... My goal is to keep, get this model and keep it as simple as possible. Five or six buckets of expenses, so at least you have some accountability of those things, but not get so min into the minutia that you end up arguing over little things. Off-campus facilities, Off -campus facilities that, that's going to need to be treated differently because it's going to be, you're usually renting that space. It may, in fact, be just a direct charge for what you're renting, and you pay it based on that. So uh, again, we don't have a cost in it other than the cost of handling, which would be part of purchasing or some contracts with that. Yeah. So, so just based on last year's uh, classes, I'm sorry, I, I will do so. The, the first question was about tuition, professional tuition and graduate tuition. The second question was, do you break space down by type of space? I apologize for that. I'll be sure and do that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we'll, we'll take it in bits so I can make sure and, and repeat them and that. So we'll take the first question. So, so the first question is, who's going to make the decisions of how tuition is allocated? We have a committee of about 25 people, okay? And that committee is looking at all those things. I can tell you that we are discussing all of these matters and the implications of them. We will come up with what we feel best fits our philosophy. We'll then put those in the models and see how they fall out. But ultimately, the president is going to make the decision of the final model. Our job is to recommend to the president a a model and walk him through what this means for all the units and he will ultimately make the decision. Mm I'll, I'll do my best. So the question is, uh, what kind of decisions will be at the local level and what kind of decisions will be at the central level? Is that fundamentally the, the question? Especially with the SIF funding or the strategic investment fund. So um, what, what, what types of models people have used, for instance, uh, at some universities, they have continued that financial model committee on uh, for, in fact, it becomes a permanent committee. And they are responsible for, mo for monitoring the model and providing input as to what uh, seem to be reasonable decisions. Again, ultimately, every decision is ultimately the decision of the president, but uh, our job is to make recommendations of those, and he can delegate some of those decisions. Some of those might be provost-level decisions where you say, you know, this looks like a key area that we need to be getting into, and I'm going to put some money into that. I would also envision that some of that strategic investment fund 
could be based on some performance metrics as well, that there might be a part of it that you could, uh, is based on your performance. And I, I, I can pull those back up if you want and take a few moments. I get, let's see, go, go in the right direction here. So this is the, uh, the current work, not the final work, of the Provost Council on Metrics. And we have said that there are, uh, we're rec gonna recommend to the president that there are five key values that we think are important for units. One being student success, one, two being collaboration, three being impact, four being into innovation and entrepreneurship, and five being diversity and inclusivity. And you can see below those different things that might be used to measure that kind of performance. This is not to compare college against college. This is for you within your college to say, are we getting better? How did you move the needle within your college? Because not all of these things are gonna fit even across colleges. Research and research dollars is gonna be very important to the College of Medicine, but somebody like Fine Arts with creative scholarship, they don't measure it by NIH grants and, and research dollars. You see what I'm getting at? So it's for the colleges to measure within themselves, and you can say, did we move the needle? And so have we gotten better? So I, I think what you've got on that strategic investment fund is a combination of things. If we end up with the committee continuing on, they will be one body providing input. Obviously, the deans are gonna be providing input into that. Some decisions are, then the ultimately decisions are probably gonna land at the provost or president, but based on feedback that they get through that process. Okay. You had a question? My question is whether whether these awards from the strategic initiative will be formulaic based on the strategic plan outcomes or whether uh, they will be by nomination from the college. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, as, as much as you might think, well, there's numbers and we can make it a formula, it's kind of hard to figure out what the weight is and what the... Um, value of each one is, and how much do you assign to it, and what if it applies to one college but doesn't apply to the other. I'd like to think that you could look at these and take them in aggregate and, and, and with the recommendations of some people looking at it that the provost could say, yeah, in whole, they moved the needle forward. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think of how I would do this formulaically to take those five points and two or three items within each one of those and assign them weights and then calculate them and then, you know what I mean? It gets pretty complicated from there. I know that sounds like there's some subjectivity to it, but in the end you can say, you know, they moved four things significantly forward. That was a good year. So I, I'd hope we didn't get that, that far down into the weeds on that, personal opinion. Can you, hang, can you hang on a minute so we got the, it just makes it easier, I don't have to repeat it. And Thank you. A couple of other questions for things like research funding, there will be up and down years is, is will there be, will it be based on a rolling average or will it be based on income during a, a given year? Uh, it could be. We're, again, we're walking through those kinds of questions. We're, for instance, Let's take even the um, tuition number. I'll just pick on that one. Should it be based directly for every year or should we maybe use a rolling average to kind of smooth it out? Because I'll, I'll go back to the undergraduate colleges. You don't, undergraduate colleges don't control their admission as much as that, say a professional school does. I mean the College of Medicine, they choose how many they're gonna admit, they recruit those, they admit them. For the undergraduate colleges, it, it's not quite that formulaic. They, you know, Don Witt goes out and recruits, and he recruits all he can, and, and he talks to the colleges, but it's a little fuzzier in there. And so, you know, maybe even at that point, we, we look at some things that are two or three year rolling averages. I don't have, again, final answers, but we're looking at that kind of thing, is how do you handle some of those ups and downs so that it isn't whipsaw? So a, a unit isn't going 
oh, it's a boom year, and oh, the next year, oh, it's a bust year, and you know, to begin to, but at least you can begin to plan a little bit because you, you know a grant and how long it's going to last. You can begin to calculate that, and if you know your retention rate, you can begin to calculate what your tuition revenues are, and if you know your uh, clinical revenue and what historically has been the trend, you can walk through that. You, you see what I mean? So you can begin to make that planning. I realize you know, a lot of the devils are in the details, but um, the, the other question was with regard to research centers that have faculty lines, um, those faculty are then often have you know, departmental appointments as well. So for tuition dollars, if they follow the faculty, it's not a concern. If they follow the department, then the centers um, are at a disadvantage. Right. So let's, yeah, let's make it even more complicated. There's some centers that don't have any tuition dollars associated with them. And so how do you handle those? And, and we're walking through exactly that. Center for Applied Energy Research. Uh, you know, those faculty have appointments in a college, and that, coll that center doesn't have any programs, uh, tuition programs, tuition generating programs. So how do we begin to give them the opportunity to participate as well? Fair question, don't have all the answers, but we're trying to walk through what that means for centers that, for instance, don't have tuition dollars. One of the comments that we've heard from faculty uh, is the idea of a university-wide birthright for faculty. In other words, some kind of equality across colleges being a part of this process going forward. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Or <laughs> since you have been a dean here. So when, when you say that, you mean that, that some way to assure that quality is the same across all colleges? Well, I, I, I think the concern is that uh, for a college that can be a little more entrepreneurish sure. and another that may not, uh, suddenly the faculty member who sits in that nice new office and they have a brand new laptop and they get to travel as much as they want and then down the, you know, the adjoining building uh, someone doesn't have the ability to do those things. And there's some concern that should we have uh, some at least minimal guarantees for faculty. In other words, uh, you're going to get at least $600 for travel and things of that nature. Uh, now I understand your question more. A uh, couple things. One, we're not taking this model down past the college level. So not taking it into departments. Okay. So it still, it just goes down to the college level. In fact, I would advocate that no dean should try to put this down below the college level for, give us at least three or four years of just having it at the college level. And so, and, and if you're a smaller unit, I don't think one or two departments or three departments is probably not even any reason to do it at that level as well. Now, let's take it back to your question, which is in, even at the college level. That's why I think you need that strategic investment fund, because you are correct. There are some colleges that can generate a lot more revenue by uh, an online program or an executive program in something or whatever. There are others that have less opportunities to do that. I would say there's even some challenges in the professional schools because they can't change their enrollment substantially because of market issues, okay? So they've got a different set of challenges in there because, you know, you can't flood the market with dentists or pharmacists or, you know, I mean, you, you got it. There's a, there's a supply and demand characteristic in there. So I think you've got to walk through those. I would argue that's why there that needs to be a strategic investment fund to assure that a unit doesn't get, a college doesn't get starved out and that there is a university of the whole and not a haves and have nots. Well, the, the other that kind of goes along with this is the legislatively mandated programs, mm -hmm. and we have a handful of them here. Uh, it may be that when we look, and uh, let's pick, you know, you, you've used 80-20 in different things or 60-40. Uh, on what percentage of tuition gets returned. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the interesting things may be that for those legislatively mandated programs, they may have to have 100% of their tuition returned to make it be transparent to uh, be able to defend legislatively uh, those activities. Well, there's $80 million of our $280 million is mandated programs. Okay. And uh, a large part of that's in the College of Agriculture. Some is in medicine and a few other places, but mostly in ag. And uh, that's something we're looking at very closely is how do you handle that uh, part? 
There's another complicating part that I just learned in the last uh, couple weeks, and that is the, the state law about uh, employees and tuition waivers. And uh, for some units, they have a large number of people coming back to get degrees through tuition waivers, and how do you handle those? And so uh, it's been very enlightening for me to walk through all the different things that are there, the points, and begin to say, how do we handle those appropriately? But when $80 million of our budget from the state is mandated programs, you've got to figure out how you handle that and how you handle it correctly. So I don't have a, a complete answer, but I can tell you we're walking through that very carefully. Um, there's a question coming through on email, um, and this is from uh, someone in Extension saying, can the colleges determine salaries and salary increases based on their budget versus the university salary policy? Okay. Somebody's watching me. Boy, this is, I didn't think anybody would be online, so. <laughs> and they, they actually stayed awake uh, from me, so that's just amazing. Thank you for watching. Um, so the question is, can, how much flexibility can colleges have around salaries and salary increases? Uh, you know, you, you already have some flexibility around salaries because you hire people and you choose that salary, particularly for faculty. I know staff, it's a different issue in terms of uh, your uh, job classification and so forth. You know, we're, we're walking through that. I think that's a, that's a presidential decision as to what kind of flexibility. Does he allow one college to give 5% raises one year and another to give 3%? Uh, or whatever. I, I don't think we've gotten through that yet, but that is something that we've been talking about is what degree of flexibility. You've got to go, in, go back again and look at the university as a whole. You've got to figure out and uh, make sure you don't end up with haves and have-nots, and you ha but you ha also have to understand if there are market pressures in some units as well. How do you handle market pressures? Some units that have to compete for faculty or staff with certain characteristics and they are uh, grossly under market, then do you give them flexibility to adjust for that? I, I, again, we're trying to walk through that, but I, that's uh, gonna be a decision that certainly the president's gonna have to endorse and we're gonna have to make sure it follows all applicable HR rules and laws, but can we allow flexibility with respect to uh, raises that might be given? So I, again, uh, very good question. It's something we're beginning to walk through. What is that range of flexibility that you have? I need to apologize for stepping out of the room and getting a drink of water a minute ago because something tells me my timing was really bad. Uh, so I may be asking a question you've already answered. Um, in, in the case of shared classrooms all over campus, how do you see the, the space cost being handled or space charge, whatever the appropriate terminology is? Um, so how do you handle shared space? I, I, could, I could argue that it's even broader than classrooms. It's um, um, core uh, research facilities. Uh, there's a variety of shared space. How do you handle the hallway down a building that's not somebody's office, and let's say that there are two colleges sharing a building, Patterson Office Tower being an example. How do you assign that because there's a hallway that separates the College of Social Work from the College of Arts and Sciences, for instance, and how do you begin to look at that shared space? It's, it's even broader, taking your question a little bit broader. But how do you hand, handle shared classroom space? Again. We're trying to keep this model as simple as possible. I would like to think that goes into the whole, you know, realizing that different colleges have different usages, different numbers of students, but hopefully we can find some way that we don't literally sit down and say, how many sections did you offer in a classroom of this size that has this charge, and so we're gonna charge you for that. I, I've never seen a university, at least that I've ever worked at, has ever gotten down to that level of detail for a, an individual classroom. But has said, here's a shared cost for classrooms that are utilized across the whole university. And here is now. What I have seen is where a college says, this is our classroom and our classroom only, then there may be a differential 
for that if they say no one else can use this room and someone agrees to let them do that. There may be a charge for that. I, I have seen that done before. I'm not saying that's what we're going to do, but those are different ways you can handle those kinds of situations. A little follow-up question related, um, which I think I missed when I did step out of the room. How does the new budget model deal with space costs in a way that it encourages units to relinquish space? What's the reward for relinquishing space? And, and I guess generally, how was that space initially funded or, or, or where was the money found to pay that initial space cost in that initial unit? And, and, and so therefore that relates to the, the opportunity they have or might have to relinquish that space to another unit in turn for some sort of reward. Sure. So you, you can tell Wayne deals with space, right? I'll pick on Wayne since we work together. So um, one of the things that I, I, I said just a little bit earlier is we don't have any disincentives to take as much space as you can, okay? Because there's no cost associated with it directly to you as a unit. I think one of the ways it incentivizes or disincentivizes people is by saying for the space that you have allocated to you, there's a square footage charge. Now again, I, I was advocating not to have differential charges based on lab space versus office space versus common space versus yada, 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 because we'll spend more time trying to figure it out than we'll ever accomplish anything. But I think one of the ways you do that is by, it, it directly hits your bottom line. When you go down to facilities and space is if you reduce that number by having fewer square feet, your expenses are less, but your revenues stay the same. So there's a direct incentive in your bottom line because you're, if, if you have uh, 1,000 square feet times $28, okay, $28,000 for space, and if you go down to 500 square feet, you only have $14,000. So the incentive to you is you have less expenses hitting you for that, uh, for that direct charge. So that's the, the one incentive about how do you transfer it to another unit or whatever, well, they're going to have to pick up that they generally have to pick up that space charge. But what's your incentive for getting rid of it is that it comes off of your bottom line or adds to your bottom line, comes off your expenses. At least that's the way I've typically seen it work. Ah, finally, this side of the room. I thought it was all over here. Jane. So I confess that I don't have an entrepreneurial bone in my body. And I'm looking at this model and wondering if institutions that have moved to a value-based model have had to consider what kinds of leadership skills and what kinds of staff skills, sure. especially in terms of managing both sides of the ledger sheet, what kinds of staff skills have to be identified in order to make this work? Thank you for that question. Uh, it's something we think a lot about. Uh, you know, I would say that we have a range of experiences and expertise with this kind of a model here at the University of Kentucky, as does every university. And you have to walk through that. Right now, with our very centralized model, it requires one set of, one skill set and, and expertise to, to manage that. And this is going to require something a little different because you're going to be thinking a lot more like a business. You're going to be thinking revenues and expenses instead of just expenses. Uh, one of the things that we've already done is implemented a business officers working group B-O-W-G, right? Got that. Uh, and we started with a small group of business officers to begin educating them, training the trainers, beginning to train a, a, a small cadre of people who can go out and train a larger cadre of people and begin to walk them through that so that we begin to spread that expertise throughout the university. Uh, the second thing is it's going to take some education of unit leaders, such as deans and directors, to begin to think about more than just the expense, expenses and managing to expenses. So uh, I think your point is well taken and is probably valid at all levels of, of leadership. Um, so it, it is a little different way of thinking, but uh, as folks begin to embrace it, I think they'll begin to see the opportunity. Uh, I, I had a, a very interesting email, and I won't tell you who it was, so I won't give them away, but it, it had been somebody who had been fairly skeptical about this kind of a model and had, had vocalized that to me several times in a very 
nice way. It wasn't confrontational. And then I got an email from him the other day that said, you know, I, I, I think I'm beginning to get this. And he said, I think there are more opportunities here than you're even telling people because you're trying to keep it simple. And I'm beginning to see tremendous opportunities for us. And this is someone from a college that doesn't have a lot of elasticity in terms of enrollment and programs and so forth. And so I think as we begin to look through this and have these kinds of discussions and begin to share ideas across, we will begin to think about those things. I mean, I, I learned from hearing you ask these questions. I learned things that make me think differently, make me think about different aspects, and walk through that. And as we begin to have these discussions and keep them going, I think that will begin to spread that. And I, I believe in our people. I really do. I believe there's some very smart, very uh, entrepreneurial people out there in a good way that want to grow this university and improve its effectiveness and its efficiency, and they will spread that word. I, I'm the eternal optimist. Hi. The operation of our facilities is a significant cost to us, and um, actually the users of the facilities can make a significant impact on what those costs are. What incentive do you anticipate that there might be for better utilization of our resources as far as energy and so forth, in particularly if it is going to be just based on a overall square footage basis or and in comparison also when much of that is done by a central plant. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna expand your question just a little bit uh, uh, to encompass a couple things because you, you've given me a nice segue into something that I, I wanted to make sure got discussed today. Uh, so the, the question revolves around how do you uh, provide incentives for uh, making space better and proper utilization of space. And, and again, one of the ways is because it hits your bottom line and you can adjust your bottom line. But there's, there's nothing to be said that we can't also, in that strategic initiatives fund, have some drivers that say, if you more efficiently and effectively use space, there might be a return to you as well. I mean, you can, you can put a lot of things in that. And that's why I, I like that idea of having some amount of money, be it 20% or whatever it is, through that strategic initiatives fund, because then you can begin to say, we want to incentivize the right behaviors. So you can actually put those things in there. I, I, I thank you for that comment. I hadn't really thought of that one yet. I was, I was, sometimes I can't see the forest for the trees. You get so far into it. But I think that's a very good point of something we can put in some incentives for folks that if you do something uh, more effectively and efficiently, you might get to share in some of that reward uh, and give that back to you. The second piece, though, I think is uh, somewhat embedded in your question, you may not have realized it, is how do we also look at uh, those units uh, that provide services to us and how do we assure that those services are also effective and efficient? And I won't pick on any particular one because you probably have your favorite one that you want to pick on. I'll, I'll leave them all out of here. But the, the question is, how do you make sure that they are also providing you with optimal service? Okay. Right now, we don't have any mechanism for that. And in fact, it's all taken off the top, right? But what we have uh, decided, and I think is something very important, is those units will also have performance metrics. Okay, performance metrics that are agreed upon by them and by some body, bo body of people, <laughs> that you agree on these are the performance metrics and they meet those, look to meet those metrics. And if they meet them or exceed them, there also should be rewards for them as well, right? Not just, we did a really good job, so you get your same budget, okay? There again, by having that little bit of flexible money, you can begin to do those kinds of things and say that if, this unit provides a higher level of service for the same or even lower cost, shouldn't they share in that as well, just like a college gets to? I mean, let's incentivize everybody to do the kinds of things we want them to do. So that's, I think this is the second part of your question. It's not just what can we as units to do, 
units do and get some reward from it, but what about those service units for accountability and for performance? They should be rewarded for good performance as well. So thank you for bringing that up because I, I, was, I was sitting there going, if he hadn't gone there, I'm going there <laughs> real quick. Okay, because that, that's the part I wanted to get to. I wanted to make sure that that point came out. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. It's sort of like Oprah, isn't it? <coughs> Definitely not Murray Povich or uh, what's, Jerry Springer. There we go. No Jerry Springer today. My question has to do with laboratories on campus. And we have lots of them, lots of duplication, mm -hmm. and they compete with each other. Um, it's my sense that there's a fertile ground for cost savings if, if the university could have laboratories working in a more collaborative sure. sense than in a competitive sense. Has there been much discussion about this and how the university would approach that? Uh, I'm trying to initiate those discussions. It takes some intestinal fortitude because everybody believes that their, their lab is the lab, right? And uh, we begin to have a discussion. I think I'm gonna speak personally now, my personal opinion, not the official opinion of the provost, but the, my personal opinion. I think we need to have a broader discussion about research on this campus and say, uh, are there three or four or five key research areas that we want to focus on? That doesn't mean you can't, you don't, do other things, but here's where we're going to make our strategic investments, and here's where we're going to invest in core resources. Because, um, as Lisa and I joke, the peanut butter effect, you know, you spread a little all over, generally doesn't work terribly well. So let's find things that we do well. Let's avoid some duplications. Let's put things together and say, what do we want to be for the future? And I think that's a, a broader discussion. I've begun having that discussion with Jim Tracy. Not to be confused with Tim Tracy. He's evil. No, I'm just kidding. We have this, we have this ongoing uh, joke about that. But I think that's a, a broader discussion that I've been trying to get going is what facilities do we need and where should we be putting our money and how do we best invest that money? Again, I'm speaking for Tim Tracy. So am I driving the cameras nuts going back and forth or are you guys doing okay? Okay. He gives me the thumbs up. Now if you can just make me look better. Yeah, right, that thumbs up. I don't believe that thumbs up, okay. Surely I haven't worn you out. Only an hour and 15 minutes in. You gotta remember I've given thousands and thousands of lectures. I can talk for a long time. All right, so, so let me close with a few comments then. First, I want to thank you for coming on this Friday afternoon. I appreciate it. I really do. You know, you never know if you're going to have a party and no one's going to show up. So I appreciate your coming. I appreciate your thoughtful questions. Those are the questions we need to hear because they make us think about it and they make us ask ourselves the right questions and begin to think of those those levers that go on and those things that move and what are the consequences. We want to maximize the intended consequences. We want to minimize the unintended consequences. Secondly, we won't get it perfect. I will admit that right now. The first shot will not be perfect. But I pledge to you, we will course correct as we need to course correct. Anybody who tells you it will be perfect first time, I'd be very leery of them. I won't tell you that. So again, we'll course correct as we need to, but I believe with these kinds of thoughtful questions, these good discussions, we will come to a better place and we will be able to generate more funds to move this institution forward because I know you're like me, you want to move this institution forward. I think we're at a very interesting place. We have some challenges, but I think with challenges come opportunities. This gives us an opportunity to look at ourselves, look inward and say, what are we, what do we want to be, and how do we get there? And these conversations, again, are one way to do that. If you are glutton for punishment, you can show up on Monday. We'll be doing this again. Uh, center Theater. I believe it's in the Center Theater sometime in the afternoon on Monday. Uh, 
For those of you who watched my little video thing, uh, my condolences to you. Lexmark room, one to three on Monday. If you subjected yourself to my video, I apologize. Uh, I was not under a gun, though. They actually uh, let me agree to do it. But uh, again, thank you. Please have a wonderful weekend, and please cheer for the Cats, okay? They play tonight and tomorrow night. Okay, thank you.